already sent in their names. A very, very warm welcome to the second of the Teaching for Neurodiversity Trainer Trainer webinars. Just to repeat that these webinars are funded by the Department for Education and are part of a larger Dyslexia SPLD support project. My name is Liz Horobin, I'm Project Director with the British Dyslexia Association. So I hope that you've all already accessed part one of the training, either through last week's live webinar or by listening to the recording. For those of you who haven't heard me talk about this as we've been going through the introductions, remember the recording is now available on the BDA website, uh, www.bdadyslexia.org.uk, just follow the link to the webinars. For everyone who's attending tonight's live event, you'll receive an email at the end of tonight's session giving you a link to the recordings and to all the relevant materials. Now, tonight's session is called Understanding Neurodiversity. As with part one, the materials that we're going to be presenting in the webinar have been developed by a consortium of leading charities in the UK, the British Dyslexia Association, Dyslexia Action, Dyspraxia Foundation, Helen Arkell and Patos, and we've had additional input from Steve Chin for dyscalculia, Fintan O'Regan for ADHD, ICANN for specific language impairment, and Ambitious About Autism. To get the most out of this session, you will need to have the combined SBLD checklist or the neurodiverse SBLD checklist on hand. The two checklists are almost exactly the same. Jenny will tell you what the difference is later as we go into the, the training session. If you haven't already accessed the checklist, please follow the link that's showing now on the slide. If you have difficulties with that, again, you can go to the BDA um, website and you should be able to access the resources there. Um, the checklist is available in different formats. There's a numbers format for those of you working on Mac. Excel for those of you on Windows computers or there's a paper-based version of the checklist. Just as we did during last week's session, we'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation, but remember you can post up a question at any time using the facility on your screen. We'll select the most representative questions for discussion at the end. Again, though, we do have a very large number of attendees tonight. At the moment we've got 220 four people attending. It's just 25, it's going up by the second, 26. So it's going up all the time. So if we don't get around to answering your question during the session, we will try to include it in a list of questions that will be posted on our websites after the event. So that's enough of me for the introductions. I'm really, really delighted again to be able to introduce Jenny Price from Patos, who is going to be delivering tonight's webinar. Jenny, over to you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Um, as Liz said, I'm representing PATOS this evening, which is the Professional Association of Teachers of Students with Specific Learning Difficulties. And just as a reminder, if you weren't with us for part one, this training does sit at a core skill level. So it's designed to be delivered to all staff and can be a starting point for an awareness raising of new neuro diversity in your setting and you can flag it on your SEN report that you've done this and also within your local offer if you're working um, within a local authority. So let's get started on tonight's session. We're going to look closely tonight at what neurodiversity means and how it relates to specific learning difficulties, or if you prefer, differences. So spelled being specific learning differences. And in doing so, I'm going to talk you through the devised checklist, which some of you, as Liz has indicated, have already looked at. If you haven't, don't worry. We're going to look at it in some depth and I'll talk you through how to use it interactively online and I hope you'll be able to then go away and have a bit of a play with that because it's in the doing that we really learn how things work best. But to start with, let's have an unpick of the term what is neurodiversity. 
And I guess if you're leading this inset for a team of um, teachers or teaching assistants, it would be really interesting to start with a question which poses exactly that. What do they think neurodiversity means? So I would start by suggesting in pairs or in groups, they have a think, have a discuss, and then feedback their ideas to the, to the wider group. You might then wish to come in and say the following information, and this is all available on the notes with the PowerPoint. So don't worry about catching it all at this moment, because you can refer back to this and the detail. The term is relatively new. It first appeared in print in 1998 and is attributed to an Australian social scientist who was called Judy Singer. So neurodiversity as a term has its roots in the social model of disability, which sees the concept of disability as rooted in society rather than within the individual. And although this term is questioned by some, it's useful to see it in terms of other labels which have been used in the past. To link cognitive function to learning and behavior. So if you've seen pediatric reports, you may well have seen some of these terms. Learning disabilities, MBD, minimal brain dysfunction, or ABD, atypical brain development. Now that terminology sounds overly medical to me and has quite a negative connotation. So the term neurodiversity perhaps sounds more positive and sits more comfortably as we understand it today. Because proponents of neurodiversity want to make it easier for people of all neurotypes to contribute to the world as they are, rather than forcing them to attempt to appear or think more typically. So I think that's an interesting starting point for discussion. Here we have a very straightforward and accessible quote, which we feel is particularly useful. And although the neurodiversity movement grew out of autism and the autism rights movement, the concept has now been expanded to include all neuro-minorities. And here we have dyscalculia, dyslexia, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, speech and language impairment, autism, and developmental coordination disorder, and others as well. So the movement recognizes that there is not just one right way to think and perceive the world. We're working towards a world where people's brain difference is seen as valuable rather than something that we need to fix as practitioners. It's also important to consider the essential differences on our understanding of a range of specific learning differences. And here is a sensible point to really clarify with your teams that they have an understanding of all the terminology. And the SPLD guide, which you can download from the resources, gives very good and very succinct descriptors of each of these. So there's lots of information for you if you want to read further and to talk further about each of these. The important points around specific learning difficulties are that they are different to global learning differences insofar as they affect one or more specific areas of learning, whereas with global learning difficulties, the learner is compromised across all areas. Specific learning differences affect the way information is processed and therefore learnt. They can appear across every type and range of ability with varying 
severity and significance. It's important to remember that they are lifelong and they are often hidden by compensatory strategies. Now one useful activity that you might want to do with your teams is to ask them to match particular behaviours or traits of different specific difficulties with the terminology. And this is where the spelled checklist might come in handy for you and also the guide to spelled. Now, as with the previous slide, the term neurodiversity encompasses all specific learning differences, many of which co-occur and overlap, as this diagram indicates. It's particularly important to notice that the various specific difficulties do overlap. This is because a learner is likely to have one or more co-occurring difficulties. And there's a nice quote from Giller and Kaplan. In developmental disorders, comorbidity is the rule, not the exception. Now the term comorbidity can be um, is equally applicable to co-occurrence, and that might be an easier to ter term to use with your staff groups. But in essence, I think it's a really interesting way of looking at this, that it is a rule, not an exception, to, be, to have these co-occurring specific difficulties, if that's your profile of learning. This has quite a far-reaching implication because if each learner is actually a mix of different aspects of different specific difficulties, what can we assume? Either about their needs or their abilities or about the type of support and intervention that will actually work for them. It can be limiting for the understanding of a learner to assume that their, their difficulties will only fall into one neat package as defined by generalized descriptions of one difficulty. Instead, we have to recognize the complexity of each individual profile and therefore treat each individually, individual accordingly. Now, at this point, you may want to pose a question. Is it useful? to identify spelled or to label a pupil as dyscalculic or dyspraxic or dyslexic. Does that add anything to our understanding? The answer really depends on what you're going to make of that information. If you're going to use it to increase your understanding of the learner's needs and to inform provision, that you subsequently put in place, I would argue that actually it's very useful to have those definitions. However, if it becomes a barrier to putting support in place and muddies the water, it most definitely isn't. By using neurodiversity as an overarching term, we are encouraging you to look at learners in a more holistic way focusing on what they can do well and what their individual needs are, rather than dwelling on the label. Moving from labeling to profiling helps to empower teachers to understand that they can provide support within the classroom. They don't necessarily need constant attention and support from a SENCO or outside inverted commas, experts. Now we come to the really interesting bit, the combined spelled checklist. We've developed the checklist which pulls together behaviours and indicators associated with a range of specific difficulties. Dyslexia, DCD, ADHD, ASD, dyscalculia. And if you're not sure, oh, and speech and language impairment as well. If you're not sure of any of those uh, abbreviations, then please do 
go to the guide where you'll get chapter and verse about each of them. And I think at this point it's worth pointing out that we had expert people contributing to each of those areas so that considerable work went into combining this checklist for you to use. So the checklist looks like this and the aim is really to discourage teachers from seeing their learners in terms of one particular specific difficulty. Aha, Joanna is dyslexic, therefore she must have difficulties with X, Y and Z because Joanna may not present that particular dyslexic looking profile. We want to encourage teachers to be open-minded and to build, to build a unique picture of their learners' needs in which a number of different spells may overlap. In other words, we want to see them in terms of neurodiversity. And this technique of using the checklist has the potential to result in a more tailored approach to meet meeting needs. So when and why should you encourage the use in your teams of this checklist? Well, if staff are concerned about a learner that is not making the expected rate of progress or is having any difficulty with aspects of learning or social and emotional development, this checklist is a quick easy to use first step within their graduated approach of assess, plan, do, review. The checklist could be used by a teacher or a teaching assistant within the school. It does, doesn't have to be completed by the SENCO. With older children, it can be useful to involve them in completing the checklist. And you may also want to involve the parents and carers particularly if you're needing to gather background information about the family history. So let's have a look at an actual interactive checklist. No, let's go back. Bear with me. Okay, so here we have the checklist interactively. You will see that there are descriptors of particular areas of learning and in the right hand column here you have a drop-down choice not at all sometimes and often so by reading through you can select and begin to work on a profile that meets that learner's needs Ooh, Okay, so can you see what I'm doing? I'm building up. I'm not putting in the not at all ones. I'm just putting in the areas that I'm concerned about. And you will notice at the bottom there are tabs here for early years, primary, post-16 and back to the secondary one. So you've got your age groups at the bottom. Yep. And they are slightly different but also similar. Now if you don't want to use one with the descriptors down the side that's also possible. Okay so you've got a choice here. You don't have to have the terminology if you don't want staff to have a preconceived idea of the particular difficulty of the learner. So here we go and so on and so forth. Now when you've scroll down and you're happy that you've got all the information that you need. You can see it's quite extensive and very thorough. Okay, so I'll just click on one more and then going back up to the top you'll see there is a filter and this is the clever bit. You can just deselect all of them and I'm going to go for the ones that are sometimes and often. Press OK and you condense it. So from the perspective of a discussion, 
you've just got the areas that they're concerned about. So it's quick and easy to use. It doesn't require any specialist training. It gives you a different framework to think about the pupil or for the pupil and the pupil's parents, if appropriate, to do it with you. It can identify areas in which the pupil requires additional support, support and then we can match to support strategies. You could also use it, if you wanted, to just look at comparative strengths for a learner, if that's what you need to do for that particular um, individual. Note that the combined checklist contains fewer behaviours for each of the specific difficulties that would normally appear on a single checklist. So it could be if you're coming out with a very clear dyslexic profile that you needed to explore that with a dyslexic checklist in a little more detail. And the very important point to make here is that a checklist is not a diagnostic tool and should never be interpreted in that way. These are traits indicators and it is this uh, process that would lead on to further investigation and thinking. So let's go back to our presentation. Do you remember Sebastian from last week? He was our primary student and Sebastian had quite a complex uh, profile with lots of areas where he was really struggling and his teacher was concerned about his lack of progress and really wanted to understand a little more about what was going on for Sebastian. She was thinking that his reading difficulties might be more to do with visual issues rather than dyslexia. She was certainly concerned about maths and ADHD alongside attendant difficulties with memory and attention. So the teacher worked with the Senko in this case because Sebastian was quite complex, who then is able to suggest in-class support to help with those particular areas of difficulty. So having filtered through and built this profile, they were able to work together on particular recommendations from the Senko that would be appropriate for the class teacher. And one of the interesting things about Sebastian was that he didn't have siblings currently at the school and therefore it was an opportunity to really meet and greet parents and to get to know a little bit more about the context and whether there was any family history of difficulties. Now Sebastian will be one of the focuses or will be the focus for the strategies for the primary phased learners that we'll be talking to you about next time and we'll talk about dates as well. So there is Sebastian. We also met Hannah and Hannah was very perplexing and a great worry I think because she had clearly uh, quite significant difficulties in terms of her social and emotional development and co-occurring difficulties around dyspraxia and dyscalculia. Those are two spells which frequently co-occur. However, Hannah's social situation and her lack of abilities around friendships and sustaining interactions with people were possibly hinting at a diagnosis of ASD. So this was a wake-up call really to everyone that we really need to do a little more work around Hannah. Now in the interim, what the Senko did with the profile is quite interesting. So let's just come out of the presentation again and I want to show you um, I want to show you this. So what we've done here is we've taken the specific areas of weakness that Hannah was showing. 
So the left-hand column is lifted and shifted. And then on the right-hand column, some suggestions have been formulated to support these areas of difficulty for Hannah. So we've extended the pupil profile really into a bit of a provision profile as well. So looking at the areas of need and matching them to particular strategies and resources that we're recommending um, for class teachers to use. Okay, so there's a lot. Of, there's quite a few there to look at. Um, I won't go through them all. We've got the coordination difficulties. We've got the ASD type issues coming up, and there are a lot about maths as well. So I hope something like this is a way of taking the. the um, checklist and personalizing it and individualizing it for a particular pupil is of interest. Okay, so I think we'll put that up on the website so that you've got that as a point of reference if you want to look at it in the future. So let's just minimize that and go back to how. Okay, so as I said, she almost certainly needs more than just the checklist. Um, input from a psychologist, specialist teacher, or possibly the psychiatrist would all be appropriate for a student presenting with these um, complex issues. And there are extensive notes that accompany the presentation that I think you will find quite interesting to read if uh, you are looking particularly at secondary learners. And again, the next webinar will unpick the particular strategies that we feel would be appropriate for a learner like Hannah. So what about your student? Well again, how else can you use the checklist to develop a profile? And I just want to show you something else what we made earlier. Okay. So this is Shan, and Shan has come um, to the school fairly recently, okay? And his main, or what was thought to be his main issue, was that English is his second language. It's apparent that his father has reasonable English, but not his mother, and it's surmised that therefore English is possibly not the main language spoken at home. A short assessment by an EAL, EAL teacher was organized and she picked up that he actually had difficulties reading in his first language as well. And his speech is unclear and he has difficulties with the pronunciation of certain sounds. So further assessment was undertaken and you can see the beginnings of quite a complex profile begin, beginning to emerge here from the specialist teacher. So he has very specific difficulties. So in this case, what they've done is they've taken the issue and then they've set some particular strategies for class teachers and teaching assistants to use with Shan over, over um, an eight-week period. Okay, and some very specific links as well. So lifting and shifting the profile into something concrete and usable. And at the top here, we've got the assess, plan, do, review process. And you can see just the brief notes there about what the support looks like. Now, obviously, your setting is, is very personal to you, and you will know if this would work. In, in that context. But just another idea for you to think about if you so wish. Okay. So what we want you to think about really now is that slow progress and low attainment do not necessarily mean that a child has SEN. At this point, you need to think about why else slow progress may be happening. 
and you could ask yourself or your team exactly that question. What other reasons can we think of for a learner that fails to make the expected progress? And you're probably thinking, okay, it could be lack of attendance, lack of opportunity, illness, maybe the effects of me medication, or if English is an additional language. The learner may be very young in their year group. And it is through this discussion and really thinking that we're beginning to gather that information and think about um, the learner as an individual and not necessarily one that automatically has specific difficulties or global learning difficulties. And if you notice a very sudden change in behavior, that may be indicative of a medical condition and can be a red flag for a referral on to a pediatrician via the GP. So the second part of this um, extract from the Code of Practice reminds us that many learners also develop very good compensatory strategies which can mask their difficulties. And a learner who is performing at an average level may actually be capable of doing much better if they were given the support that they need. And in my experience, that's particularly true of dyslexic girls who are very adept at finding strategies and working around their difficulties. And you don't always spot them in the classroom. So please be aware that we need to be on the lookout for children that might potentially be achieving at a far higher level. So learning challenges and their predominant features may become apparent at different times throughout an educational career. Remember that learning difficulties occur across the range of cognitive abilities and if left unaddressed, may lead to frustration which may manifest itself in disaffection, which then results in emotional or behavioral difficulties. Our role as teachers is to notice, respond, and adjust to pupils' needs, to recognize their challenges as early as we possibly can, and put in place provision to support them. So what are the next steps? How will you take this information the second part of a three-part training and cascade it back to colleagues. What particular resources and activities do you need to make this meaningful in your setting? And at that point, we're very happy um, to think about your questions and do our best to answer them. So I'll hand you back to, to Liz, who's going to lead on the Q&A session. Liz. Thank you so much, Jenny. I hope you've all found that to be a really thought-provoking session. Lots of questions usually arise from the use of the checklist. I've had a few coming through as you've been talking, Jenny. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a breather while I, I, I answer the easy ones, and then I'm going to throw the difficult ones you away. So <laughs> Olive was asking about the HANA profile and if we can make that available. So yes, definitely we'll be putting up the, the additional materials that Jenny has shown that are not part of your current delegates pack. We'll be making those available on our websites so everybody will be able to access those. Amy was asking about strategies and asking whether the checklist links to suggested strategies. It doesn't, and I think there are lots of very good reasons for that. Nobody else knows your student as you know them. It would be inappropriate, I think, for us to link strategies to the checklist because different strategies are going to work for different individuals and it takes a knowledge of what works for the individual to really know what strategies to put in place. However, we are discussing strategies in next week's session, so that should give you lots of ideas for taking forward, Amy. Now, Kit has asked about strengths and Olive also raised this point. Why have we not included strengths in the checklist? 
I have to say this is something that we, we did do when we started to develop the checklist, but consultation with various focus groups led us to decide that actually it was very problematic because strengths are so individual to each particular learner that it was it was very difficult to compile a list of, of strengths that, that fitted into the checklist. I don't know if, the, if you would like to say something about this, Jenny, as well, but it's certainly something that we would like to work on in future, and if we are developing the checklist in future, it's certainly an area that we're going to look at. Jenny, is there anything else that you would like to say? Well, I, I would suggest that you could actually um, use the checklist in that way because if you think about it, um, sorry, just let me do it this way. You, if you wanted, you could look at not at all as a strength and then filter it in that way, thereby compiling uh, a process of strengths. I don't know if it's possible to alter these, Liz, once you've downloaded it. It, it certainly is. I mean, we have always said that any of the materials we produced for this, this project um, are not cast in stone, that, that people can alter them in any way that they want to. And a checklist is not a diagnostic tool, so you don't have to, to feel that it, it has to be used in exactly the way it's, it's presented. You can adjust it. And mm. various people have, have asked us over the, the last few months when we've been doing live events if they can adjust the, the checklist. And I, I see absolutely no reason why not um, to fit your own particular situation. I think that's absolutely okay. Mm. So, so can you see what I'm doing? I'm sort of building up a, a strengths profile here, and then yeah. I can filter it accordingly. Um, yeah, so just one idea that you could do. Yeah, I think that's a very good suggestion, Jenny. Yeah. Okay, I've got a, a query here from Andrea Porter, who's saying, is slow processing a problem in its own right, or merely an indicator of a bigger problem? In the USA, I've, I've learned that it's a diagnosis or a term used in its own right. What would you say to that, Jenny? Yes, it's, it's a core area of um, investigation when you're undertaking an in-depth assessment of a learner. So yes, it, it, it is important to look at processing speed, and I would agree. Mm. And of course, there may be all kinds of different reasons for slow processing. It's a very complex area. Abigail is pointing out that the checklist may be a good way to get started before a child is put on the SEN register, as the class teacher could have responsibility for a term using strategies from the checklist before Senko intervention. We would definitely agree with that, Abigail. We see the checklist as being the initial tool to, to start working immediately with a child. So often um, time is wasted by waiting to, to decide whether or not some larger assessment is going to be put in place or not. The checklist enables people to look at the, the, the various issues that are going on with a learner and to put something in place straight away. One of the most important things in the checklist is the fact that there's a box at the bottom that says, what are you going to do now? What are your next steps? What are you going to put in place? That's the really, really important thing. There shouldn't be a delay. People should think, this, this learner is not making the progress I'm expecting. Let's have a little look at that in more detail. Let's see what we can do about it. Janet is saying, I help students with dyslexia and dyscalculia. I have several students with dyspraxia but have no idea how to aid their learning. Where can I get information on how to help them? Janet, go to the Dyspraxia Foundation website. Um, you can find links to Dyspraxia Foundation information in the, the guide to SBLD that we've provided as part of the materials. They have excellent resources, absolutely excellent. Um, Beth is asking again, is the electronic checklist available online? Yes, Beth, follow the link that uh, Jenny showed you. Jenny, I don't know if you want to go back to that link again on the, the second slide. Also, Beth, if you go to the BDA website, you can access it there. Um, 
Michelle is asking if we can put the link up again at the end for the resources, please. So, Jenny, if we can go back to that slide, that would be fab. Yeah, and I think what people need to do is when they when they open that page, you just need to scroll down a little bit to find the neurodiversity resources. There are a number of other resources also on there. So the person that said they couldn't find it, it's probably it was down down the bottom of your screen, as it were. Cool. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Joel has just pointed out that everything can be regarded as strengths, and I think that's a very positive way of looking at things, Joel. And again, it fits in with the idea of neurodiversity. Very often, something that, that we view as being a, a, a learning issue in the classroom is a, a strength if only it's used in the right way. Philip is addressing that as well and saying, in our special school, all students have a statement or uh, an EHC plan. Um, since last week, he's discussed the notion of pupil profiles with other staff and there's a good deal of interest. However, the statements already have a great deal of information and therefore we may assume that the learning differences are already identified. He supposes his main question is, with annual reviews, etc., would you recommend using the checklist on top of the information you already have? What would you say, Jenny? Well, I, I mean, I'm not one for making extra work, so I think it's about weighing up the pros and cons of both approaches. You have to do the EHCP annual review. If the checklist is a different lens that you can bring to that activity, then I would suggest it was a good good thing to do. However, it would then mean that you had that um, basis to, to review in future years um, at the next annual review. So it could be the benchmark, couldn't it? Starting um, it with new pupils might be a, a sensible way forward rather than in a complex needs school. I know that you're doing reviews all the time and it, it's quite a burden on teachers to prepare. Mm. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Kerry is pointing out that strengths are identified within the pupil's profile. We hope they would be, Kerry, definitely. And she's saying, so therefore these would be incorporated into the strategies used in the plan due review cycle. And we would certainly echo that, Kerry, that this would be best practice there. Um, Janet is saying getting every subject teacher to complete at secondary level could also allow you to see if there are any patterns or hotspots which could inform planning for intervention. I think certainly at secondary level, asking different teachers to complete the checklist could provide so much information about the individual and about the, the, the subjects and the lessons that, that work for them and the ones that don't. I think they could reveal great amounts about the, the people. Um, Anne is asking about some of the reasons for slow processing and how it feeds into various SBLD. Does it appear across the range? Jenny, do you want to take that one? Uh, yes, it certainly does appear across a range of um, these specific difficulties. I think the challenge is, you know, how best to assess speed of processing and what type of assessment tools do you have in school that you can use to do that. Some of them are closed tests and you need a particular uh, level of qualification to use them. You may have a psychologist coming in who, who can do that for you, or you may have a specialist teacher with that requisite um, level of qualification. But you do need to know what you're doing with speed of processing. Mm. Uh, thank you. Anna has asked a very similar question about having uh, different teachers complete the checklist. So I hope uh, what we've already said has answered that. Um, Anna. Sarah is asking if the different checklists have the same or different statements. Uh, Sarah, they all have the same statements. The difference between the, the two checklists is the labelling. The, the first checklist that we produced for the project was a combined SPLD checklist and that had the labels going down the sides. Uh, so we had different statements that related to dyslexia, dyspraxia, so on. Feedback that we had from people attending the training sessions was that they would prefer to have a checklist or some people would prefer to have a checklist that didn't have the labels. So the checklist that's called neurodiversity SPLD checklist doesn't have the labels. 
the combined SPLD checklist does have the labels. That's the only difference there. Um, Uh, do, do, do. I've been asked if we could repeat the dyscalculia website we recommended. Did you recommend a dyscalculia website, Jenny? Uh, not specifically, no. I uh, think I, I mentioned Steve Chin, Sarah. Um, Steve is, uh, is one yeah. of the, the leading experts on dyscalculia in the UK. His surname is spelt C-H-I-N-N, -N, Steve Chin. If you Google him, you'll be able to, to find his website. He's got excellent, excellent materials for dyscalculia. Um, and, and there is reference in the notes that accompany the PowerPoint list to uh, a publication that's particularly useful for assessment of dyscalculia. Yeah, thanks Jenny, thanks. Um, Leslie says she's working with a child who's showing signs of ADHD and dyslexia. Where can she find strategies for ADHD? Jenny, you'd like to take that? I, I guess what you need to do is listen in to the next part because ADHD encompasses you know, a lot of the strategies that will be recommended. And I'm, I'm sure the presenters will, will talk about that and take particular questions. Um, now, Carolyn has raised a question that Cedric uh, raised at the very beginning about motivation. Cedric had said, um, could we talk about the greater significance of motivation versus IQ? And Carolyn is echoing that by saying, do you think the lack of motivation can present as some of the statements on the checklist? Jenny. Oh, I think I think that's a real. I wish we got longer to discuss it all. That's a really interesting. It's a big, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, I I mean I think it was. I drew attention to the work of um, Bob Burden from Exeter University, and it was his research that was talking about the absolutely critical part that motivation plays in academic success and when, uh, sadly Bob has died, but when he did the research, uh, his findings actually indicated that measured IQ contributes no more than 40% to the final outcome. So that most psychologists now agree that when it comes to progress and individual learning, it is intrinsic motivation that is key and that's a real challenge for us as practitioners isn't it how do we engage and motivate our, our learners and again I think Liz that's one of the key areas that will be addressed in the third part of the presentation motivation comes up there doesn't it yeah it does um, and various ways for in encouraging motivation and I think also it's, it's worth thinking that you, you have to consider the difference between the intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and the, the effects that, that those will have. Um, if there's intrinsic motivation and if you can develop intrinsic motivation, that, then that's going to have an enormous benefit for any learner. Mm. Um, I'm just flicking through again. Oh, here's a good one from Jessica. What can you suggest for learners who can read well but have poor comprehension? Can we suggest any resources for comprehension? <laughs> Again, that's an enormous question, Jessica. Um, very often, comprehension, poor comprehension, may be caused by just poor language issues uh, and language deprivation. But Jenny, what, what would you have to say on that? Well, for me, that, that's a lovely question. I love this question. Um, I would absolutely recommend starting with a simple view of reading and doing the exercise where you look at your class or your group of readers and you determine where their particular strengths and weaknesses are in terms of accuracy of dec decoding and comprehending text. So that would be my first suggestion. Get a, get a real picture of the depth of difficulty that you're dealing with. In terms of particular approaches, I personally like SQ3R, which I can send you uh, further information on, and also using 
something such as a complexity grid where you're really getting to grips with the span of different types of questioning levels where you're moving from factual questions into inferential. And those of you that I sent the resource around reading last week will have got those through because I, I included them on the information that we emailed out to you. So if you're interested in comprehension, for me, those are two things that work very successfully. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the Catch-Up Literacy Programme. I think that's um, a very good resource, good intervention to use. And I think we would also draw your attention to the Education Endowment Foundation as a really rich source of research around effective interventions. Then there's Greg Brooks. You can look at his research on what works for children. And again, there will be information about comprehension and techniques that you can use um, within that. Quite an uh, established approach is reciprocal reading. And there's lots of information on the website around reciprocal reading, which is worthy of note as well. So there's considerable wealth of um, information and resources that you can access. hope that is helpful. Fab, Jenny, thank you so much for all of those suggestions. It's brilliant. Um, Olive has come back to us with some ideas about strengths, and she says that uh, in her setting, what they look at is what learners are extremely good at, and then they explore how they do what they do. For example, if, if the learner is very good at sport or chess or seeing the big picture, how do they do it? They explore that with the learner, which is a, a great suggestion. Um, one of the most important questions, I think, that you can ever ask a learner is, have you learned something successfully in the past, and how did you learn it? And then discuss that with them to find out their learning strengths. Um, Liz, can I just say at that point, that really yeah. resonates with metacognition, and yeah. that will be one of the strategies that I hope the presenters next time will really delve into, because I think metacognition has actually been proved to be one of the most cost-effective and um, deliver the most productive outcomes in terms of using TAs in the classroom. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's it's cost-effective and effective, isn't it? Yes. Abigail has, has raised an, an interesting point. She says, would you expect the checklist to change over time? Um, that is, after strategies have been put in, would we be able to use this as evidence of progress for the SEM yeah. department? Yes. Yeah, I, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Mm. I would certainly hope that once strategies had been put in place, then um, you would begin to see uh, different. Uh, Catherine is asking if she could have SQ3R resources. Um, this is something that, that we'll be able to address after the session tonight, Catherine. We'll be posting some of the questions and some, some more information and links, so do look out for that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, sorry, sorry, Jenny. Liz, sorry, it's worth saying that SQ3R is a methodology, mm -hmm. so I guess what I'm really saying is it, you would take the format and you would need to make the resources that best suit your learners. Yeah, yeah. Catherine is mentioning the reading resource box from Devon LDP. Um, I don't know that Catherine. She's, Catherine says she's found it very useful. If you've got the link that you'd like to, to share, Catherine, I think if, if you pop it up now, and say send to all, then everybody should be able to see it. Otherwise, though, we can include it with the links that we, we put in our, our document. Um, Nikki is also asking about the complexity grid. Um, Jessica is saying, thank you for the fantastic information. I echo that, Jessica. I think Jenny's information here has just been fab. Um, more re requests for the reading resources, so again, we'll definitely put that up. Uh, we're going to, to share emails in just a moment, Sarah. She's asking for our email addresses. Um, 
and Olive is saying that metacognition is their strategy. Here's a goodie from Karen. She works in a behavioral unit where many of the pupils have poor reading comprehension skills. How can she get them to engage? That is a huge question, isn't it, Karen? Um, obviously, by trying to tap into to learners' interests. But Jenny, what would you like to say about that? Oh, that, that, that's such, such a challenging question. Um, it, within the context of my own work, we do um, an approach called seeing through behavior, which is really interesting, but I can't talk about that to you now. Um, I, I would say it's worth looking at something like the ELSA training, which is most emotional literacy support assistance. And that's a very effective um, approach that can just break down some of those issues in a, com in a behavioral unit. But you really need to look to your own um, local authority resources here. I don't think it's appropriate for to suggest anything particularly, because I'm sure there are particular ways that um, your behavioral units are working or should be working. Um, we are getting up to 8 o'clock, so we are going to finish in a minute. a minute. I am aware that people have been asking for different links and different resources, but we will put these up online, guys. Catherine, uh, you've said here is a link for the website, but I can't actually see one. So I don't know if... if oh, here we go. Um, do you want the website? If everybody's able to see that, that website or not, it's www.babcock-education.co.uk, but we will be sharing that along with other resources in our, our documents afterwards. A very, very quick last question. Are there strategies for motivating for maths with a 14-year-old boy with a dyscalculia profile, mild dyslexia, <laughs> and severe verbal processing disorder? Anna, I honestly don't think we've got time to go into that tonight, but we will try to come up with some answers in the document that we put online. I am going to call it a day there, I'm afraid. Thank you so much to all of you for your questions. We're really sorry it hasn't been possible for us to answer everything, but Jenny has very kindly offered to continue answering questions up until the end of January, at which point she evaporates in a puff of smoke, as all the best good fairies do. Um, however, you can also email me until the end of March, March 31st, which is the final date of the project. Our email addresses are on a slide here, which Jenny is about to show. Jenny, could you go to the, the email yeah. slide, please? That's bad, thank you. Um, so Jenny, yep, Jenny will answer questions until the 31st of January. I'll answer questions until the 31st of March. Remember to look out also for the, the questions that are going up online in the documents that we um, will be putting up. Remember part three of the training is going to be delivered next week by our colleagues from Dyslexia Action. It's split into the three different levels. We've got primary happening on the 31st, secondary on the 1st, and post-16 on the 2nd of February. So do make sure you sign up for the correct level. If you want to attend more than one, please do. Thank you again so much for attending tonight's session. We really hope you come along to next week's ones and look forward to seeing you there. Thank you and good night.